I'd like to welcome everybody tonight to the Jones Center that so kindly uh, has allowed us to host our second town hall meeting. Um, thank you for everybody taking the time out of their busy schedule and their life to come sit out here and, and visit with, uh, with our commission and staff. I, want, I do want to tell everybody that this is being live streamed, okay? And, uh, and it's available on the AGFC YouTube channel. And so, just so if you want to go back and look at it and review some of the answers that might be provided tonight, that's a means by which you can re-review it. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, recognize a couple of people, and I just visited with Mr. Bill Ackerman, and I, he's at the Embassy Suites, and unfortunately, I think that was my own doing, but he's heading over this way with his sweet wife, Bootsy. Uh, Sonny Varnell and Corrine are here. Sonny Varnell is a former commissioner for the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission, and Sonny served from 2003 to 2008. Welcome here tonight, Corrine, your, his wife. Glad y'all are here. We have uh, Brother Ron Duncan, one of your own, right here in your backyard, uh, who is the only commissioner that I know of, and I think in the history, that has served two terms as chairman of the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission. And so, Ron, welcome here tonight. I don't see Teresa. She's not here with you, is she? Yeah, you worn her out anyway. Uh, welcome here, Ron. Glad you're here. Our own president of the Arkansas Game and Fish Foundation, Deke Whitbeck, is in attendance tonight. Deke, welcome here, and thank you for being here, and thank you for all your help. You do a wonderful job. Um, I'd like to introduce some of the staff. I'm not going to be able to catch everybody because we have quite a contingency, but I'm going to introduce our director, Mr. Pat Fitz, right here, and his two deputy directors. One is Chris Racy, and one is Chris Callclasure, right here flanking either end. We have our chief of fishery, Ben Batten, would you raise your hand? Our chief of education, Miss Tabby Kenyon, where are you, Tabby? You're right there. Okay, thank you. Uh, our Chief of Wildlife, Brad Corner, is in the house tonight. We have a Major, Glenn Tucker. He's going to take care of our enforcement, and he has a stun gun ready to go. Um, we have our CFO, um, Miss Jamie. Are you, you here in the house? Jamie Fisher's way back there. We have our Chief of Communications, Keith Stevens. Would you raise your hand? Thank you for sitting way back there. And uh, our Chief of IT, Dustin Holden, is in the house as well. Thank you for helping us get this thing set up. Without any further ado, I'm going to keep moving along um, with our agenda, and this is very simple. We are going to show a video, and it's going to be about five or six or seven minutes long. And then the whole goal of tonight is to spend time with the people that we serve. And I want to go more into that as after the video and as I'm welcoming and introducing my fellow commissioners. So why don't we, Dustin, go ahead and start that video and we'll watch that and then we'll reconvene in a minute. Arkansas, the natural state, the 
Ozarks and Washita's to your Delta and Coastal Plain, our nickname is well deserved. And for more than a century, the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission has been working to keep this day true to its name. The men and women of the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission dedicate themselves daily to conserving the state's most precious natural resources. From managing the habitats that support fish and wildlife and provide public opportunities, to enforcing the state's hunting and fishing regulations, our work is all about passing along a conservation legacy to future generations. After European settlement and the widespread landscape changes that came with it, many species were either wiped out or pushed to the brink of extirpation. But the Game and Fish Commission boasts an impressive history of bringing back numerous species. There was a time when just seeing a deer track was cause for celebration, but now Arkansas hunters annually harvest more than 200,000 whitetails, including some extraordinary bucks. The Game and Fish Commission's mid-20th century work to restore black bears to the state is considered one of the most successful species reintroductions in the world. Land purchases and the construction of lakes have put quality outdoor experiences in reach of everyone, and the Commission's expansive hatchery system helps to maintain robust fish populations. Mandatory hunter and boating education has made the state's woods and waters safer for everyone. Keeping the natural state true to its name requires a concerted effort by nearly 600 employees. Wildlife officers work around the clock to ensure compliance with the state's hunting and fishing laws. Game and fish biologists use the latest science to ensure the long-term sustainability of game animals, as well as hundreds of other non-game species that are vital to maintaining healthy ecosystems. Managing wildlife means managing habitat, and game and fish actively manages more than 380,000 acres owned by the agency, in addition to working with conservation partners to help manage another 3 million acres of public land. The Arkansas Game and Fish Commission operates five fish hatcheries to reinforce natural reproduction on the state's 600,000 acres of lakes and more than 90,000 miles of streams. More than 9.5 million fish were stocked last year, and fisheries managers spent countless hours Arkansas streams and lakes to monitor fish populations and adapt regulations when necessary. There are more than 400 boat ramps and more than 75 fishing piers that provide public access to Arkansas waterways. Game and Fish operates four nature centers and four conservation education centers, which host more than a quarter of a million visitors each year. And a new education facility is under construction in Springdale. The agency's popular youth shooting sports and archery in the schools programs reach more than 60,000 Arkansas students every year. The Arkansas Game and Fish Commission is also working to meet present and future challenges. Since the 2016 detection of chronic wasting disease in the state's deer and elk, Game and Fish has tested thousands of whitetails and established regulations try to prevent the spread of this insidious disease. The creation of a research, evaluation, and compliance division, complete with the agency's first wildlife health veterinarian, will help game and fish confront CWD and other fish and wildlife issues with the latest science and most effective methods. Feral pigs remain a constant and serious threat to wildlife habitat and native fauna, which is why game and fish has devoted almost 65,000 man hours to remove close to 16,000 feral pigs from the landscape over the past five years. The agency's work to bring back the Bob White quail has resulted in nearly 25,000 acres of quail-focused habitat projects in the past year alone. To maintain the natural state status as one of the continent's most important wintering areas for migratory waterfowl, Gator Fish is working to meet its goals under the North American Waterfowl Management Plan by managing more than 8,000 acres of important moist soil habitat. 
The agency recently embarked on a plan to conserve the forest and its green tree reservoirs by adapting water management strategies so future generations can enjoy the incredible green timber duck hunting that has made Arkansas famous. One of Game and Fish's newest and most important endeavors is its work to stem the decline in hunting and fishing participation that plagues states across the country. The agency has embarked on an ambitious mentor hunt program to introduce more Arkansans to the joys of the great outdoors and create a new cohort of conservationists who will carry an ethic of stewardship into the future. <coughs> Conservation comes in many forms. It's getting your hands wet on a cold winter morning to keep tabs on fish populations. It's teaching someone to fish. It's a dedication to service with the knowledge that the work we do today will ensure a better Arkansas for tomorrow. Thank you, Dustin. Y'all come on up. Um, fellow commissioners, we're going to move our chairs over here and kind of get rearranged for a minute. <clears throat> I'd like to um, introduce uh, my fellow commissioners. I'm Ford Overton, chair of the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission. And um, just to remind everybody about the commission, the governor appoints one commissioner each year around the end of June time frame to serve one seven-year term. And I'm on my last, oh, heck, I've got this meeting, April, May, and June. June is my last meeting that I will then hand the uh, gavel over to the uh, vice chair, which is uh, Ken Reeves. So it's been such an honor to serve on this commission. It's been such an honor to get to know the agency and I'm so proud that we're here before everybody that we can answer questions. We want tough questions. We don't want the layups. We want to be able to address the people that we are appointed to serve. We have a wonderful staff at the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission. Un unbelievable, unbelievable. We are right now embarking on the largest project that the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission has ever, the largest construction project that we've ever embarked on, and that's off of Wagon Wheel Road here, the Northwest Arkansas Nature uh, Center and Regional Office, which is exciting, and we've broken ground and, and actually moving a lot of dirt. And so that there, there's a lot of activity going on up here, and this is just a prelude to it. So <clears throat> with that being said, this is Commissioner Ken Reeves from Harrison, he's the vice chairman of the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission. And then uh, Joe Moore, uh, uh, Andrew Parker was appointed after Ken. He's from Little Rock, Arkansas. Joe Morgan from Little Rock, Arkansas. And then there Bobby Martin, right there, your own Bobby Martin from Rogers, Arkansas, that has done a tremendous amount to set up these next couple of days. Thank you, Bobby. And then we've got Stan Jones from Walnut Ridge right here. And uh, uh, J.D. Neely from Camden, Arkansas right here. Dr. Stephen Bropre is on staff at the University of Arkansas at Fayetteville Campus. And he's the eighth member of the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission. He's a non-voting member, but it's in our Amendment 35 that a member of the Arkansas University of Arkansas System, head of the biology department, would serve on the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission so we would have a resource of information through the university if we needed biological data, science data, and he's, a, he's been a wonderful resource for this commission. So we're here tonight, and the agenda is to, to talk to y'all. Ask any question. I know we have some questions Chris uh, yeah, has uh, um, signed up, but we're going to have a moderator. Trey Reed is going to moderate this session in order to be able to proceed thoroughly through the questions and any issues that you might have. Trey's been with Arkansas Game Fish uh, Commission for a long time, does a wonderful job 
for the commission. But uh, the agenda is very simple. We want to hear from you. We want to be able to respond to you. We want to be able to answer any question to the best of our ability with the resources that we have. We have plenty of staff here. And so uh, with that being said, can I hand the gavel to you, Mr. Trey Reed, and why don't you take it from here? It's a good thing that I uh, used to do some uh, used to do some theater, I, I, and I projected out. I, I, I hope y'all heard that. <laughs> I, I think this one's working. Hello, everybody. I'm Lonnie Robinson. Uh, I've just got a comment. I want to personally thank the Game and Fish Commission for coming to Northwest Arkansas and hearing what the sportsmen of this area have to say and the questions we've got for you. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Robinson. Next is Tom Hughes. Where's Tom Hughes? Okay, thank you. Uh, next is Raymond Lake. Well, we may get through this faster than I thought. Mr. Lake, Raymond Lake. Okay, thanks for being here, everybody. Uh, uh, Kathleen Anderson. Meeting. Kathleen, do you have a question or comment? My main interest is the regulations, BAFIT regulations that were passed and took effect last, last October. Sorry. I said my main concern is the bait fish regulations that were passed after a lot of um, unpopular uh, comments about them being passed and took effect last October 1st. And I'm just wondering if you've ever had uh, as much controversy about any regulation that you had considered before and what you did think of the public being so against the regulations as they were passed because they have definitely put a burden on the striper guides across the state of Arkansas whether you believe it or not it's a, a fact uh, thank you for your question, Ms. Anderson. I think a two-part uh, addressing the uh, the bait fish uh, prohibition and, and also I, I saw a lot of commissioners nodding. Has there ever been anything more controversial? <laughs> uh, I'd like to address it, and then I'd like for one of y'all maybe to follow up. And... Is that on? Okay. Um, thank you for bringing that up. It It has been controversial, not the most controversial. You know, if you look at our mission statement and the pledge that we take as commissioners, the number one thing is to preserve the resource. The number one thing that we are committed to do is preserving the resource. The reason why we made these decisions is based on the staff information and data that we have depended on to not allow the spread of these Asian carp into our waterways that will uh, take over the system. I, I would defer, Ben, to you or any comment that you might want to make related to that. He's our chief of fisheries, but before we go there, uh, it's to preserve the resource and the staff recommended we go this route. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Andreessen. We've had some conversation and, and uh, 
I, I appreciate the opportunity to bring it up here. Uh, Commissioner Overton hit, hit some of the most important things. First of all, Amendment 35 charges the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission with doing everything we can to protect the resource of the state of Arkansas. And I would say as a biologist, uh, aquatic nuisance species or any invasive species on land as well, these are some of our greatest challenges that we face in terms of conservation. And this regulation to, uh, and just for the room in case folks aren't familiar, back in October, we made a regulation that basically said you could not carry bait fish or crayfish uh, essentially from one body of water to another. If it's in the same system, you can take it downstream or, or, or within the same system, but you cannot move things from one system uh, completely to another. There's multiple reasons. One is the spreading, as, as uh, Commissioner mentioned, of Asian carp. Uh, that's a really obvious one. These are the fish that jump out of the water, hit people, uh, and can be a danger. Would uh, be a real problem if they were established uh, on one of these lakes where people boat and ski and tube and things like that. Um, and uh, the other thing is though, besides just the things you can see that we've talked about, like the carp, there are diseases like viral hemorrhagic septicemia, infectious pancreatic necrosis, largemouth bass virus. Uh, there's mussels that are invasive that, that you can't see where you may be transporting fish and you just have shad and you think it's okay, but there's still a risk. And over time, the most risky behavior we can do is transfer organisms directly from one body of water to another. So that's why we made that regulation. All right, looks like the next uh, person is W.R. Ross. Is there... I'm Randy Ross from Bentonville, and my question is, have you given any consideration to adjusting the duck season? Since the climate has changed and we're getting colder weather later, has that been addressed or is that an option? Or how do you designate those times? Thanks for the question. Uh, Mr. Ross, I'll answer that just a little bit. We're all probably duck hunters and then might refer to Luke over there. But, you know, the federal, gov federal tells us that we have to be finished by the end of January. And, you know, we, if we come in way too early, then the people in South Arkansas don't, have as good a season so we're trying to fit the need for everybody and you know we're trying to get a little bit early have a split season then go to Christmas and then we start right after Christmas because high school kids are out they need to hunt while they're out of out of school and the regulation that we've put out there this year is uh, what we think fits as much as possible and getting everything in we went all the way till the end of January just so last year it didn't get cold very you know it, it was way warmer than it needed to be and a lot of ducks didn't come down so we this year ran it all the way till till the end of January and Luke you want to you want to talk more about that you know more about the regulations and seasons one one thing to note to follow up on Commissioner Jones here to to your point for the first time ever we will be able to hunt Till the last day of January this coming season as opposed to the last Sunday in January right yeah Commissioner Jones and, and uh, Trey pretty well summed it up where who asked what? there you are all right yeah so they, they summed it up pretty well there's federal frameworks we fall within and really then it's just a balancing act there, there, there's really no uh, I've been here for 13 years and there is no perfect answer to how you set duck season and so we kind of as staff uh, try to recommend something that's going to balance it out and there's a there's a value in having some early days there's a lot of waterfowl habitat provided particularly on private lands because of those early hunting days and they really only give up nine or ten out of a 60 day season and, and then you kind of break it uh, as commissioner jones said and then move most of those days then are back that fi fi it'll be 50 days if approved uh this year that'll be you know, well into December, all the way through the end of January. So this is, uh, this is the first year, uh, it's been about 20 years since the duck season framework changed. Uh, back in the late 90s, it shifted to the last Sunday in January, where it used to be the Sunday nearest January 24th. And so one out of every six years, I think, six or seven, the duck season, would, the last Sunday in January would be January 31st. 
Next year, it would be uh, the 26th or 27th, Brad, I think. Um, but the commission decided to accept the recommendation to go ahead and go to the 31st, not close on a Sunday, to allow those extra five days, I think it is this year, later into January. The first time that's ever been offered, and they're, they're, that's the recommendation on the table right now. All right, uh, let's move on to Martin Brooks. Mr. Brooks? Mr. Bobby Martin a little bit earlier um, would like to hear somebody um, some people touch on whether we think the ducks seem to have slowed down in Arkansas over the course of the last few and whether uh, we think it may be the weather pattern that may be affecting it or food source um, up north or what the Commission has thought about about doing that and then a little sidekick would be how do we think the uh, the water level system in the Biomita Refuge. Um, you know, we have dry zones in there now. And uh, whether it worked this last year, I think we had so much water it didn't do worth a hoot. But, um, and I guess, is, you know, is it gonna, that program going to continue? And just, just some thoughts on that. So mainly the first question. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you for your question. And I'm I'm very familiar with Biomeda because I'm down there just about every day. But, you know, these ducks, uh, I don't know that there is one answer. It's a combination of a lot of things. The weather, it, uh, based on what we saw this year, it stayed awfully warm north for a long time. Stan's in the northern part of the state in uh, Walnut Ridge, and uh, <clears throat> he experienced a lot of what we experienced down south. But uh, I, I try to tell people, if you had a perfectly good meal sitting on your dinner table at home and the weather was lovely, you wouldn't drive all the way to Little Rock to eat dinner. Those ducks are going to stay where the food is and until they get frozen out, and I'm not talking about too cold, ducks got a down jacket on they wear year round. Those ducks are going to go south when their food gets covered up and uh, water gets frozen up and they're going to be looking for open water and sources of food. Now, <clears throat> agricultural processes today, the combines are a lot more efficient than they used to be. So there's not near as much food left in a lot of these rice fields as what we used to remember doing. So to, I guess to answer your question, I can't say that there's any one thing that we could put our finger on but Mother Nature would probably be the overriding factor, at least that's my opinion. Now, Luke, you can speak to that too, because that's right down your alley, but I think our weatherman has affected our duck season considerably in the last couple of years. It's been a very unusual years with... Uh, Well, Game and Fish this year uh, did some food plots to try to uh, enhance some areas, and uh, you still got to have ducks. Uh, if the ducks don't come, the food plot's a moot point. And uh, Luke, if you'll go ahead and address that. Thank yeah. you for your question. Yeah, I think uh, let's maybe we can talk a little bit more afterwards. So I don't, if somebody doesn't care so much about ducks, I could go off in the weeds a long time about duck migration. I'm not going to do that right now, but. Commissioner Morgan summed it up. I mean, I think the weather is stuff we can't control. Um, you know, there's a lot of theories floating around out there right now. Um, a lot of them really got fired up this past season, kind of a perfect storm of, or lack of storms, I guess. Um, and, and a lot of that's a little bit over, overdone, in my opinion. I mean, it's, it's uh, uh, if there's something going on up north, let's, it, it didn't change last year drastically from the year before and the year before that, right? Maybe over 20 or 30 or 40 years, but we didn't see what happened last year flip in one year. Like it just does, didn't suddenly change like that. But the weather, but the weather did a lot. That that was the main driving factor. So, as far as food plots, we manage. Uh, it kind of there's a you got to kind of put it in context. So we've got about 8,000 acres of non-forested wetlands that we manage, and about a third of those each year, as part of our annual man, our normal management cycle, will be planted in some sort of cover crop, typically a millet of some some form or fashion. So yeah, about a third of those acres are, are, are tilled up and planted each year. And, and so you ask a question about uh, Biomeda 
as well. Um, Right. It, it, well, been doing it, been doing it one way for about 50. Um, so we're probably going to try to shift this way for about another 50. <laughs> if I, if I, just for a really off the cuff answer, I think we're learning more all the time about how to manage the GTRs and what the exact flooding dates are needed. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of issues going on down there right now that with all our boards are open, everything's, it has nothing to do with duck season. There's a lot of water in there now. So probably a bigger concern maybe even um, right now but but we're gonna keep we're gonna keep moving forward with with our revised water management dates on GTRs and you may see look five years down the road you'll probably see something that's a lot more adaptive and not just a fixed date but but just plan on in the for the foreseeable future it'll be uh, the same flooding dates that we've had the, the second part of that question uh, just for those folks listening at home was specifically about biomeda and water management and i would would refer folks to agfc.com slash gtr we've got a lot of information uh, that explains uh, the processes there as, as well so if you're listening at home uh, m that resource is available uh, looks like sam weathers is next S sam or was that there we go mr weathers uh, <clears throat> yes, this is a actually a local question coming from my son-in-law. He's wanting to know any news or new th uh, things that are coming in from uh, the Lake Weddington resources. Any Questions about Lake Weddington. I'm, uh, I'm guessing, I, I see uh, Ben Batten looking at John Stein, who uh, is a fisheries biologist here in this area, and uh, he can probably address that better than anybody. Lake Weddington is owned by the Forest Service, and we do work with them to uh, manage the fish populations. As you know, right now they have a drawdown going on, and that's to uh, reduce the aquatic vegetation they've had. But uh, we are looking at writing a fisheries management plan, working with that with the organization there, and uh, looking at how we're going to move forward with uh, management of the fish populations in lake in that lake. All right, next up, it looks like Don Andresheen. Don? Hi, I'm Don Andreessen. I run a striper guide service. I'm sorry for pronouncing your name wrong. Yeah, uh, that's okay. Um, we, we are bait fishermen. I also are good friends with Washita guides that are bait fishermen. And we sort of felt that we have been targeted on this uh, bait fish, uh, stopping transportation of bait fish. And Ben, I had a couple, really one real good question for you. Um, can the birds transport these fancy diseases that you had mentioned earlier? Yeah, there's many ways that various organisms can be transplanted from one water body to the other. And hands down, without a doubt, carrying, carrying organisms and water from one place to the other is the most risky, most dangerous thing that we can do. Also, that's something that game and fish we can work with. Unfortunately, I cannot regulate the birds on what they can and cannot do, but I can uh, work with our anglers, and, uh, and that's the riskiest behavior we have out there. Just one more question. I actually have changed my process of hauling bait. I would go and haul Beaver Lake water to the Arkansas River, and I would put the shad into the Beaver Lake water and then haul them back home. We hand-picked every one of those baits. There was no water transfer whatsoever. We caught the bait. We used them. This resource over there in Arkansas River being a guide on Beaver Lake, we were told we got to get them out of the lake, and it's virtually impossible for me to run my business and the Washita guides too, on on the basis that you're wanting us to do hand throw 
or catch bait on the lake that you're fishing. And we've really struggled this year. My uh, stringers on my website prove everything that we have had a tremendous time trying to catch fish with, since this October uh, first ruling went into effect. And I wanted to just make it very clear that I think we're being targeted as the easy fix, which it ain't. Your birds are your problem. And we really feel like we were going to try to work with you and help you guys out by hauling water from the lake and not using the river water. Hey, sir. Let me, sir, th this is why we're here. Why, why do you feel like you're being targeted? We're going out of business, sir. I know, I know but... We but, are literally I know, starving. but why, why do you feel like you're being targeted? That, because that, we're like an easy thing, like, oh, just stop that water from coming over here, and in, you'll stop evasious species. But when birds can do what's, what's happening, transporting the larvas and stuff from lake to lake, pond to pond, like the blue herring, the white herring. I go down to your Lone Oak, Arkansas to buy shad. They hit me for 600 shad, $1,070. I get them home. I look at their water that they're using. It's filthy. The tractors are filthy. You look over their ponds. There's nothing but white birds, herrings flying everywhere. They're sitting in the ditches and the mud puddles. And, you know, I'm bringing back they offer you water down there too. Use our water. Um, I'm hauling Beaver Lake water even down to Lone Oak to get their shad, put it in my water, and safely get them back to where I don't bring no diseases. <clears throat> I'm sorry, but I really have tried hard. I'm a guide for 39 years on Beaver Lake. I started fishing Beaver Lake when I was 18 years old. I'm 63 now. And to be told that we can't work something out and, and try to do a safe way of harvesting bait to bring the beaver because it's virtually impossible to catch bait on Beaver Lake. Five hours, 50 baits, all mostly too big. You, ha you can't hand pick your baits the size you want. It's just been a nightmare trying to put people on fish that you, are paying from out of state to go fishing with your Arkansas here in Beaver Lake and Washita. The guides are st same. <clears throat> the Washita guides, I hear them every day calling me, and they're 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 wondering what are we going to do now? Lone Oak, Arkansas is out of shad. You can't even go down there and buy bait if you wanted to. We were promised a resource, a bait from Chris Racy. Hey, Don, I don't, don't mean to cut you off, but we got a lot of people to ask questions. I'm going to hey. let Ben respond to you, and then we're going to have to move on. Hey, Trey, I, Trey, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to jump in front of Ben. Uh, Don, look, I mean, I want to say this from the commissioners because part of the reason we're here uh, is to let you talk directly with us also. And, you know, look, I think we're probably better than a year together uh, on this conversation in the pursuit of an answer. Uh, I think the chairman, uh, Ford uh, Overton, he said it right. I mean, there's no reason for you to think that you're being targeted. But I think you're going to have to accept this. We are clearly together on a journey. Same as we're dealing with, C with CWD and deer, same as we're trying to get rid of the feral hogs and so forth. You know, there's not an easy solution. To tell you that, or for you to think that people are not trying to come up with another solution, we didn't like being disappointed finding out that the Lone Oak operation did not come out and come up as fast um, in terms of producing the size of shad. We thought that'd be a solution. We're not going to give up on that one either. But as commissioners, I mean, we're going to stay the course. Invasive species have a lot bigger at stake than us just talking about a little bit about what we're talking about here. We talk with other guide services, and, and for you guys, you know, and I would say this to you, you, you have traveled about everywhere you could to be in front of us, and we respect that and admire that. And you know we want to keep the communication lines open, but you, you're just going to have to understand. We've taken a strong position. It's not easy. It's a difficult decision. But to not compromise now on the direction we're going to protect our waters, protect our wildlife for the long term with what we know is a very dangerous uh, species to allow it to ever get established. 
Whoever gets established gets farther. You cannot put the genie back in the bottle. I wish you didn't feel the way you, you do. I really do because I promise you this staff has not quit working on a solution and won't. All right, looks like uh, Edward uh, Jaworski. Just a quick question. Where did Hooked on Fishing go? Tabby? This is Tabby Kenyon, our Chief of Education. Hi. So, Hooked on Fishing, Not on Drugs, we um, rebranded the program. It's called Fishing in the Natural State now. And um, it works directly with schools and teachers to get kids uh, out fishing. So, it's still there. We just gave it a new name. All right. Next is did Mr. Javorski, No, no, no question there. Uh, Colin Hargrove. Colin, no question. Uh, Tim Schmidt. Tim. Good evening. My name is Tim Schmidt from Springdale, Arkansas. And uh, first of all, I just wanted to thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate all and, and ladies appreciate all you do in our state, and uh, just high praise for the game and fish. Um, one area where I, I feel like you guys might be missing the mark is with the feral hogs. And I spent a lot of time in the woods on public land, and I understand some of the reasoning why you have banned hunting except for during big game seasons. But uh, just today I was in the woods and saw just tons and tons of sign. No trapping is happening where I was at. I did find one trap. I've only seen one trap in the last five years in Arkansas on public land, and the trap I saw it today and it hadn't been used in a long time. But you know, you've got an army of hunters that are out there in the woods, and I get you know, the, the reasoning, well, if we allow hunting, people are gonna transport live hogs and put them in places. Well, I would say, find those people, take their hunting licenses away permanently, and you'll stop that problem quick. But you've got an army of hunters out there, there's no way you guys can effectively trap all the acreage of public land. So let us get out there and do it. Allow baiting during non-big game seasons. You guys use bait in your traps. That's how the hogs come in. Well, if we put some bait out, the hogs are going to come into us. We can take out a lot of hogs. You get a couple hundred thousand guys out there, we'll take out the hogs for you. But I feel like right now it's kind of an adversarial relationship between the fishing game and the hunters when it comes to the hogs. So anyway, again, I do appreciate all you guys are doing. I know it's a big problem, but we want to help. You got guys on the ground in the woods that can do a lot for you. Anybody want to res respond to those comments, or should we move I, on? I want to say thank you for making that comment, and, and uh, where were you? I'm just curious as to where you saw the trap. This is out by the buffalo. By the buffalo, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let me make a comment about that. I, I have a farm, and, and we shoot pigs on my farm, too. And, you know, seven or eight years ago when they first came, they were fun to shoot. You know, I'm uh, private. It's not WMA or anything, but they were fun to shoot. Well, they've got out of control and I thought us shooting them was the right thing to do and I not at all arguing against you because I understand everything you're saying but you know I'm not sure that that me shooting them on my farm has been the right thing to do because when I think this year we killed 28 hogs on, on my land but but the river's been flooded a lot and so they left pretty quick but when you shoot into a group you just scatter them and and the ones you scatter you won't see again I'll kill one or maybe two at the most, and then those other six or eight, they're gone, and they're going to go to an area where you won't see them again. So I agree if there was 200,000 hunters out there shooting them, it would take a whole lot of them out. But I don't know that just shooting is the right answer. We looked at some other things, and we, at our last meeting, we probably spent 45 minutes on trying to figure out the best avenues and other universities that's looking at kaput and some other things to to get rid of these hogs they are a problem and we know it and you know from turkey eggs to quail eggs to tearing up ground it's not something we like and we we do look at that you, know, you said you trapped 16,000 in the past five years but you've estimated there's about 200,000 and to keep the population in control we got to get about 70 percent so 16,000 in five years 
it's just not getting the job done. And I, again, I know you're trying, but it's not happening. I think it wasn't your suggestion that that we allow you and other people like you to trap pigs, not shoot them? Or did well, I either one. I mean, I, I guarantee you got hunters that would – and you can do some kind of a permit with it, you know, whatever you want to do, but you, you've got people that are willing to help, and, you know, you, you don't have the manpower to trap the millions of acres that need to be trapped. You just can't. Are you talking about on public land or private land or both? Well, I'm talking about public land, but I've got – you know, we've hunted them on here? private land, and I also hear what you're saying about they scatter, but they'll come back. They're, they're social animals. I, I've studied hogs. I've followed hogs. They'll come back together. You put a feeder out. We've, we've killed hogs on the same feeder time and time and time again on private land. They'll come back. Well, I think I speak for all the commissioners in saying we share your frustration, and we recognize we're probably not going to trap our way out of this problem. We have learned in areas where we're actively trapping that, shooting pigs messes up the trapping process because you you want to try to catch the whole sounder get it into a trap enough days that you know that you've got them all and then catch them all and kill them all and if somebody shoots one and they disperse then you've wasted a week or two of effort but there there are things on the horizon as as commissioner jones mentioned this caput which is you know which is yeah. a poison. It's highly controversial right now, but it's the first thing I've seen as commissioner in six years that gives me any hope that someday we'll have something we can feed these pigs to get rid of them. Right now, we don't want to take a chance on on harming any other wildlife, but we share your frustration every day. I got you and then I'll shut up, I promise. I, I get what you're saying about the shooting disperses them and messes up the trapping, so why don't you guys pick the areas you're going to trap close those to hunting and the areas you're not going to trap open it up you can put something on the website and say these areas are closed to hunting because we're trapping the hogs here and let the other areas go i think that's worthy of consideration but when you've got uh, several trapping teams working all over the state and moving every week it becomes kind of a logistical problem but it's a good suggestion and i'm gonna ask our wildlife people to take a look at that thank you might be good to note here that the governor just signed some legislation last week that's going to give us a few more tools uh, to, to deal with feral hogs. So uh, it's obviously a, a, a big problem that, that is, troubles this group and, and all of our staff as well. Uh, I'm going to try to get the name right, maybe the third time's a charm, Ron Andreessen. Did I say it right that time? I want to thank you all for being here and giving us this opportunity to meet with you. Um, I had another thought on the bait transporting. I know some of you are very against it, but is there not a way that we can hold a class and educate these striper guys that have thriving businesses or used to have to where they can use like a chemically treated water, like Don said, he uses his own Beaver Lake water because he doesn't want to transport something from the bait farm since their water's so nasty. Is there any way you can educate these guys, hold a class for them, charge them like a thousand dollar fee or something, which would help the game and fish funds um, for a bait permit. And then they would know exactly what to look for. Because in my thinking, no one should be smarter than them because they're on that lake every day. And if you guys feel they're going to contaminate the lake, they should be educated. Because you got boats coming from Oklahoma that stay at Don's place they take him he takes them fishing the next day they launch their boat their tanks are full of shad or whatever that they've gotten from their lakes thinking they're going to save money on bait and they start throwing it in the water here those guys are going to contaminate this lake and Don can educate them if you guys can provide a class and add a fee whatever you have to do but educate these people. They're capable of learning, you know, why the biologists can be the only ones that know what to do is beyond me. There's got to be some kind of chemical you can put in that water. Then you load your shad you get from the bait farm or the river or whatever, and by the time it's back, it's safe to use in Beaver Lake rather than risking ruining this beautiful lake. I'll take it. Uh, Andrew Parker. Um, 
I think I've spent the last five years that I have been on the commission spending a lot of that time with the fisheries division and I would be the first to say that that group appears to be in every experience I've had very willing to do whatever they can to try to encourage a recreational sport they're uh, certainly very aware of the of the effect this has had on the striper guide business uh, I, I'd also note that there has been a tremendous amount of effort working with members of the legislature from both uh, Central Arkansas and Northwest Arkansas to try to continue to find a solution that does help protect that industry, which is a great one in this part of the state, but also, as the others have said, take every step possible to protect that resource from those invasive species. So the answer is I, I believe um, that our fisheries team would say well, they're certainly willing to do whatever possible, but I think there will continue to be a line drawn that we're not going to take steps that they have reasonable concern are going to impact the quality of that entire resource for every user that uses it. So, Ben, I'll turn it over to you for additional. Yeah, thanks again, sir. Uh, so, first of all, I want I want to address, and the commissioner said it, but I uh, I am very sorry that anybody would feel targeted by our regulation. That's not our intention at all. I'm here to pr protect the resources. I'm not. Yeah, and so let me, let me uh, uh, point out a couple of things that are problematic with that. First of all, uh, when you have a three, four, five inch um, threadfin shad, gizzard shad, skipjack herring, and uh, silver carp all laid out together, they're very, very similar looking, even to a biologist. And to be honest, the behavior you're talking about carrying fish like that from, from the Arkansas River uh, to Washita or Beaver, I would not uh, knowingly allow my staff to do that because there's just no need. It's, it's, it's too risky. The other thing is the treated water, the chemically treated water. Uh, anything that's going to kill virus, uh, glochidia, uh, the uh, reproductive larvae of mussels and other uh, species that may, there, there's a virus probably floating out there right now. We don't even know what it is yet that's coming. Any chemically treated water would not reduce the risk of, of those organisms. So. Uh, I'm Steve Beaupre. I'm the uh, biological advisor to the commission, non-voting member, and uh, I just want to say something about invasive species, and then I'll say something specifically about these Asian carp. Invasive species do well in an environment because they have no natural predators and, no, and they're not susceptible necessarily to natural diseases that occur in that place. And so they reproduce, they have high reproductive output, and they reproduce like mad. A beautiful example of this are the Burmese pythons that have invaded Florida. And if you go down to north of the Everglades and try to go raccoon hunting, you're not going to find any raccoons. And the point is, the same thing is going to happen with Asian, uh, not the raccoons, but the, the Asian carp have a way of altering the structure of the food chain in the lakes that they invade. Ben, correct? And that altering of structure causes a collapse of the food chain. And I can't emphasize enough that I feel strongly about this because the fishery is going to collapse if these fish get in the, in the, in the lake. Of all people, I would expect to want to protect that resource at all costs. It would be the folks that make their living in that, in that resource. And I appreciate everything you're saying and everything, but it's just not a simple problem. We have to build a wall and stop those fish from getting in. Or we're going to see the resource collapse. And that's my professional opinion. All right, next up is Larry Voss. Larry? Here comes Jeff with the microphone. There you go. Hi, Larry Voss from Bentonville. And uh, I'd just like to talk about fish stocking, specifically at Beaver Lake, and uh, stocking of stripers and walleyes. How do you determine the number of uh, fish you're going, or yeah, fish you're going to raise, and uh, where you're going to deposit them? And do you have any ideas on what we can do to increase survivability of those stocked fish? I'm guessing that's a John Stein question. <laughs> it's 
So you were asking about, where are you? I didn't see it right there. Okay, you were asking about striped bass and walleye. What, what determines our stocking rates? On striped bass, we annu every three years we go out and we sample the fish population, sample stripers, or we work with striped bass guides to determine how fast they're growing. Right now, Beaver Lake striped bass are growing. Right now, Beaver Lake striped bass are growing. They're, they have the fastest growth rate of any lake in the country. They're getting 28 inches in four years, and uh, that tells us that. We can recommend the full stocking rate based on our striped bass management plan, and that is seven per acre or 200,000. So that's kind of how we determine our stocking rates for Beaver Lake for striped bass. For walleye, we are, uh, wall the walleye is a new fishery in Beaver Lake. Um, they historically were in the White River when the lake came in, when the lake was dammed. For some reason, they did not, did not do well in the lake. And, uh, we started stocking walleye in around 2000, and the first really big year class we had was in 2008, and that's, that, that fishery is fairly new. So right now we are doing some uh, a stock contribution study on the walleye in Beaver Lake, and we're stocking 100,000 annually, and we're marking those fish, and then we're able to go back out in and find out you know, what's the stock contribution. And in the future, we'll hopefully be determine do we even need to stock walleye? Let's say stock contribution is really low. We may not need to stock them anymore. Or if it's, if it's very high, that's going to tell us that, hey, we're going to need to continually stock to supplement the fish that are out there. What was the other part of your question? Um, as far as like striped bass, there's, a, there's kind of a concern there. Like so we've tried in the past, at some other lakes to do a uh, like boat stocking, but a lot of times when you're hauling fish from uh, hot springs, which is four hours away, we're trying to minimize the amount of stress on those fingerlings. So we really had, we thought about maybe we need to stock those fish from a boat ramp with a boat. You know, have anglers come out and help us distribute them. But we're concerned about over. Uh, handling of those fish because the more you handle them the more stress they're going to be so right now we're just doing a you know a, getting that getting the fish from uh, the, the Holsey hatchery and hot springs they're getting a four and a half hour dried here and we're boat stock or we're stocking them at a, at a boat ramp we're just concerned about some uh, you know handling those fish too many times I think the uh, next uh, name on the list to ask a question is David Krimitz. Uh, I'm David Krimitz from Fayetteville. Uh, 20 years ago when I moved here, the Democrat Gazette used to publish the uh, fish survey data for the local lakes, and it sort of disappeared over time. I'm not sure exactly why, but I was wondering if it might be possible to reinitiate uh, publication of those fish stocking data and Josh Stein, John Stein will answer this question. <laughs> ben? Thank you, uh, Dr. Krems. Uh, yes, so we, we, are, are, we have a scientific reports page on our web page that we are just right now, as of the last couple months, really starting to populate with lake management plans and uh, and and uh, reports. Also, there are individual lake pages, and over time, we're trying to get those updated as well. And then, of course, you can always get on and try to find John Stein, and he, he can get you uh, anything. Uh, w w I grew up in uh, Springfield, Illinois, and they did a state of fisheries article every year about March when fishing season was kind of kicking off, and that's something I've kicked around. We've got a couple of journalists here uh, in the audience, and uh, if either of them want to pursue something like that, we'd be happy to do it. All right, next is Marion Morgan. Thank you. I'm Marion Morgan. I'm from here in Springdale. I want to compliment you gentlemen on the, uh, the video that you showed earlier. It was very, a very nice presentation. And it brings to mind the questions that I have tonight. I'm very concerned when I hear that the sale of hunting license is declining, not only in Arkansas, but nationwide. 
the participation levels of our kids is going down. What can we do about that? But one thing that we can do, gentlemen, is we can bring a rifle range, a shooting range, to the most heavily and most densely populated part of the state of Arkansas. The Hobbs range has been closed indefinitely. There are no other public ranges in reasonable driving range, uh, driving distance. What can we do to make that a reality? One of the commissioners want to start, or are we just going to go straight to Tabby? <laughs> Money. No, no. Uh, you know, number one, uh, let me go back to the first premise. Uh, we all have to be, uh, you know, alarmed at the declining rates. Uh, not just because, you know, we don't want to lose a, a liberty and so forth that we know, but obviously, you know, uh, having the, the risk of hunting, hunters and fishermen going away, uh, they're the sportsmen that really fun. The conservation and everything that we're talking about already I would say and you, you specifically talked about rifle you're not just limiting rifle though right yeah uh, I you know I'll let Tabby speak to it in a minute and there's other representatives here off the staff that are up in this area that have been advocating obviously we work with the school uh, programs with the shooting programs they all cry for the same thing they need a place to go practice and so forth and that that will happen we've got I think where's the greatest grant in here Grant's not in here, but I, Tabby can do it. Tabby, how many, I know we've got at least four sites that we have been working on and looking at. One out by Weddington's been pretty popular. Uh, Dr. Beaupre is another one that champions that as well. Uh, getting them built, getting them open, and then getting them managed and run is a challenge. Uh, we've learned that in other places and so forth, but I promise you, it is a w big top priority with all of us. And part of what we're doing up here is uh, this population, I mean, just where we're putting our nature center, we know we've got over 50,000 uh, school uh, school age kids there. We've got over 100,000 right. really in our area. Uh, we'd love to see them all get introduced to it. But, Tebby, what, what specifically in terms of our shooting range opportunities that we're working? So, Grant Tomlin is my assistant chief of education who's over all the shooting ranges. So, he gave me notes for this question tonight. Um, we, this, this part of the state is our top priority for finding a spot, but finding a spot for a shooting range on a piece of property that's large enough, that has willing neighbors and enough partnerships behind it to be able to make this happen is really difficult. And it's something that we've been working on. We've been looking at sites um, with the Forest Service at Weddington Wildlife Management Area. The city of Salem Springs approached us to partner on it and within their city limits, we couldn't find a property that would actually work for a shooting range. So if you find a property with willing neighbors of 150 to 200 acres that has the right geography for a shooting range, which means not necessarily in a, a river bottom, not on the side of a hill, those sorts of things. Um, please let us know. We will help pursue this. This is something that we really want to see happen up here too. We have thousands and thousands of kids in our archery in the schools program, as well as in our um, Arkansas Youth Shooting Sports program uh, in the schools up here. And we want to see that happen for your community as well. Yeah, I, I just go back and say this to you, and I, and I really want to not skip over Ron Duncan challenging us on what happened to Hook on Fishing, not on drugs. And it's not just rebranding to rebrand, because back when Ron championed that, it was the same thing. We were already seeing some of the decline. We were not seeing enough young people coming out and enjoying the outdoors, and specifically hunting and fishing. So you ask, what can you do? Uh, we've got a job to do that Tabby just laid out, but what you can do is what you just did. Uh, and that is continue to help speak out. And I'd say that for everybody in the room uh, to kind of be a part of. Say that again. Uh, a. Amen. Yeah. Look, I mean, you're you found a lot of friends here and uh, and we're not going to skirt it. But yes, sir. My name's Paul Blackburn. I live in Fayetteville, lifetime bow hunter, bass fisherman, and 
pretty much anything to do with hunting. And uh, she was talking about, again, putting another gun range over here on Weddington. That one didn't work. It was too much shooting. You could be sitting in the tree and a guy pull up on the side of the road, throw out his skeet, and you in there, and he's shooting all up in the trees as you're sitting there. I don't think that's a good idea to put that back there. I just want to comment on that. I've got other things to say. I'm sorry I didn't make me happy. All right, let's, uh, Mr. Morgan, I think your point is, is well taken. I think you've got a lot of allies uh, on this stage and, and in the audience among our staff. And uh, I, I think uh, I, I'm correct, uh, interpreting correctly that there is a, a willingness and a desire to, 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 to get you what you want and what the people of this area want. Uh, next on the list is Larry Ropp. Larry Ropp may have left. I've seen a couple of people go out. Let's move on down the list. Uh, Roger Yarborough. Roger Yarborough. Hi. Thank you, men, for being here and women for being here and supporting uh, Northwest Arkansas. Uh, I've got kind of a two-part question. My name's Roger Yarbrough. I live in Springdale, Arkansas, and I've bass tournament fish for years. Uh, we've come into a situation on Beaver Lake where we're having lots of tournaments out here and no catch and release boats. So you're, you're looking at, you know, two, three hundred boats in a tournament and all the fish are being dumped back into Prairie Creek right there at the marina, so which means there's tons of fish in Prairie Creek. And also the second part of it is about the spawn on Beaver Lake. When you've got that many boats fishing in April, to give an example, Bass Cats out holding a Thursday and a Friday tournament this week, and there's six to 800 boats in it. And then you have uh, NWATT, which is holding a 200 boat tournament on Sunday, the following week. Two weeks later, you got Beaver Lake Elite Series holding a 150 boat tournament. And then you have, uh, following that, I think on uh, Sunday, you have uh, another tournament with about 80 boats in it. So that's a lot of fish being released right into Prairie Creek area. That, that was my two part question. Ben, John, who's. <laughs> It's spring. Boy, it's fishing season, huh? Uh, hey, this is a question I've been hearing a few times recently, and I know John's been hearing it for years. Um, let me start off by saying bass fishing and fishing in general has changed significantly in our mentality, especially in terms of harvest. And some of these lakes, when Beaver Lake started out back then, uh, you had a fish fry at the end of your bass tournament. You knocked the sides off every one you caught. And so we've come a long way since then. John shared some data with me from a March, April, and May 2014 creel survey. What percentage of bass do you think in a creel survey, so of several hundred anglers, what percent of bass do you think were taken home by anglers? No, just fishermen in general, out, out fishing, how, what, what percent of bass? Probably 25%. 2%. 2%, okay. 2%. So I say that to say, look, it is important, and, and I'm a tournament bass fisherman myself, and we need to do everything we can to take care of these fish, and that's why we've invested in the nicest facility in the state up at Prairie Creek. But we also need to remember this is a renewable resource, and... Though that's not ideal to move that many fish, I will say I had a conversation recently with uh, one of the major tournament circuits up here, and we talked about doing something we recently did on Lake DeGray, which is we had an old uh, fish hatchery uh, hauling tank uh, uh, that came off the back of a truck, and we worked with them. They're going to put it on a flatbed trailer, and then that way maybe every other, every third tournament they can run fish out to another part of the lake and spread it out. So that's kind of how we're looking to help spread that a little bit. But I do want to say from a bio biological perspective, I would only say I have mild concerns, though I understand it's, it seems like a lot of pressure. In terms of a lake that size, it's not a major threat. So as far as that would go, I, you know, myself, I th even thought about buying a boat to haul fish, but then you have to have the tournament officials use you 
you yeah, know, so. I, I will say in our experience, the boat is sometimes more complicated than the benefit. You'd be just as good off to haul them up an arm or, go, you know, just go to another boat ramp on, on a, a, using a fish box like I'm talking about and just spread the fish out that way. Uh, the boat thing's great, but it's really not that much of an advantage to go drop them around. And, and you're going to be hauling them longer, your chance of stressing them out worse. Sean Campbell. Thank you. My name's Sean Campbell. I'm from Rogers, Arkansas. And I've got a question. Uh, every year, it seems like here in the past several years, I'm a predator hunter. And I've had to use rimfire rifles, and um, I've wounded several coyotes, not knocking them down right then. And then laws have started to change about using center fires, suppressors, stuff like that. But every time I look in a book and we're a certain place I want to go, I have a hard time distinguishing can I, what can I use there. And then I make phone calls. And they say it's up to the law enforcement officer, his interpretation of the wording. I don't really like that. That deters me from going to different areas. I would like to know exactly what can I use, where can I use it, and what are the laws for center fire and suppressors for fur bear and predator hunting. On the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission owned wildlife management areas, you can use, um, if I remember correctly, it's any caliber center fire rifle you want. Um, it, it, there for a while it was 30 caliber or smaller, but I believe we changed it um, a few years ago. Now it's any caliber. Uh, but as far as the rim fire, uh, what, the only area around here that used to be that was Weddington Wildlife Management Area because that's owned by the U.S. Forest Service. That was their regulation. Uh, they've, I believe, actually changed that now that you can use uh, any caliber out there you want as well while uh, predator hunting. In the back of the hunting regulation book that we put out every year, it has every uh, wildlife management area and uh, federal owned WMA as well. And so since Weddington is cooperatively managed by with Arkansas Game Fish Commission, uh, it's included inside there. It has all the regulations pertaining to Weddington back there. Uh, so it is included in there and uh, If, if they got specific on every little detail, that book would be about that thick. Uh, we could carry about five, five books in every box. Hey, let's, uh, let, you bring up some great points. Maybe y'all can get together uh, when, when, we, when we break up from the group setting here and, and, and get into a little more detail on that. Fair enough? Uh, one more thing, and this goes for basically any of that stuff. There, there is a contact number inside the book. Uh, it's you can contact uh, who would be in charge of that area and what you can uh, like on Weddington Wildlife Mansion area or McElroy you're more than welcome to call that number you're probably going to get hold of me or uh, one of the officers that's working that area and they can give you a specific answer right there uh, so <laughs> it, it's it's not up to the interpretation I mean it's spelled out in law there there's there should not be any interpretation in it all right, let's move on to uh, Dina and Greg Jones. Yeah, just Greg. Uh, I'd like to thank the Game and Fish Commission for all the things that they do do as far as setting seasons and uh, changing the regulations to where we've cut down on the fall turkey season because we've had a limited number of turkeys and whatnot so I think they do a real good job there. I guess my real question is um, I've got several of them but I'm gonna just take one and that is is there anything because I know we're we're hurting in our area for the number of fawns that survive and also the number of turkeys that make it through to adult. And uh, 
primary reason is uh, we got too many predators. I uh, just started trapping two years ago, caught seven coyotes with five traps the first year. Last year, I caught 14 coyotes with the same five traps, and I'm not even hurting the population. Uh, way too many raccoons that are going in, and I'm sure they're destroying the turkey nests. Uh, is there anything that's being done by the commission to encourage other people to trap? And also, is there any waivers? I know there's depredation permits that are given for uh, deer damage and stuff. Is there any way I can get a depredation or we can give depredation permits for being able to trap year round uh, for some of those? Finally, somebody asked about a turkey. A big one. Um, on the turkey question, um, the answer is yes. We actually are planning um, two landowner clinics coming up this uh, one in June, one in July, uh, where we are going to be training landowners, club members uh, about management, uh, habitat management. Uh, things that we can do with our uh, how to trap uh, ways you can improve your habitat through burning and spraying you can actually help protect those young poults and turkeys if you have the right habitat um, so things that uh, you can do on the ground will greatly impact uh, the populations Predators certainly are at the top of our list. We've already talked about the wild hogs. We know they're detrimental to our turkey and, and deer population as well. Um, we've got to educate our, our hunters about the coons and, and coyotes and bobcats, some of those things that uh, they can be actively on the ground. When hunting season's over, you don't need to go sit in a couch. You need to be out there trapping um, and out there on your place doing some some habitat things that can uh, can improve it. Um, as far as deer depredation permits, who wants to pick that one up? Uh, I don't know, Brad. Uh, are there? Oh, coyote. Yeah, uh, year-round coyote shooting and and. Trapping, I'm not sure that's going to be uh, up to our biologists. Brad? Brad Corner, our Chief of Wildlife. Yeah, so uh, uh, just had a brief conversation with our director and probably wanted to at least say that, uh, you know, we, we do recognize and we're hearing the concerns over um, uh, at least the, the appearance of effects that predators are having and, and I guess going back to the other gentleman's question about the confusion about um, fur bear uh, either hunting or trapping regulations on areas that we are looking at ways to simplify and streamline and, and remove potential hurdles, uh, whether it's fur bear hunting or trapping regs that would uh, that would serve as a as a, a hindrance to people uh, trying to participate. So over the next year during our regulation cycle we'll be looking uh, to both uh, how can we simplify our guidebook so that our regs are easier to understand but also what regulations can we uh, relax so that there's more opportunity uh, for those people that want to try to uh, whether it's raccoons or coyotes or whatever it might be how, how can you uh, encourage for those people that are so inclined to, to take more of those animals. So we're, we're having discussions, working through that process, uh, and, and I would uh, uh, encourage you to look for those as coming up in future proposals. All right, next uh, question is from Jeff Gamble. Jeff, on the left side. Hey, good evening. I just want to thank everyone for the wonderful program that my wife and I are involved in, and that's the Arkansas Youth Shooting Sports Program. We have been uh, coaching here at 
shallow Christian in Springdale for nine years. And uh, I guess my question was already asked, but we're, we're so looking forward to a shooting complex or a shooting facility where we can help grow this program in Northwest Arkansas. And I don't know if there's any other AYSSP coaches here tonight. But You know, uh, you've been taking home so many trophies, I don't know if anybody else wants to learn. <laughs> you don't We're, need any more practice. <laughs> Thanks for what you do. Well, thank you all for uh, instituting such a great program. And uh, we, anything we can do to help build this program or get this uh, shooting complex built up here, we're willing to help. All right, thank you, Mr. Gamble. Uh, this, uh, Utah Seagraves? I'm Utah Seagraves, I live in West Fork. And a question came up to me and I wasn't aware of. First question, why is Hobbs shooting range closed? And the few times I've been out there, I can probably understand because it's extremely funny to me that you're shooting at a target and there's pock marks everywhere, everywhere. People are abusing it, but that doesn't give me an answer as to why Hobbs is closed. But my question is, what are we going to do about the deer population? As subdivisions grow and grow, the deer are losing their environment, and so they're coming in. They're eating my tulips. I can't have tulips in the yard. They even started this year eating my azaleas. And the azaleas are three foot from the house. So they're just like tame goats. And if we don't do something, you know, we gotta, we got to expand the kill. That's what I'm saying. On the first part of that, uh, Tabby informed me that I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but Jay Snyder from, from Hobbs is – is in the room. Am I putting you on the spot too much? All right. Thank you for your willingness to uh, address that question. Jay Schneider, Assistant Superintendent of Hobbs State Park. Uh, shooting range uh, is over 12 years old. Um, we had a representative from the company come out and do an inspection. Um, we're having a major problem with uh, overuse. Uh, the fix on it's approximately $150,000. Uh, replacement's going to be over $200,000. Uh, I've been speaking with the engineer. It comes out of Action Targets out of Utah, kind of a proprietary system. They're the industry standard in capture systems. It's not a, a earthen berm. It's a lead capture system where we actually harvest five tons of lead out of that every year. That tells you how much use it sees. So we're working with our upper management. You know, obviously we didn't plan on a hundred fifty, two hundred thousand uh, dollar fix, uh, but we are working on that, and that's a couple months out. You know, they said if we, whichever route we choose, it's going to take some time to to manufacture what we get and ship it and install it. So there's a fix coming. We're looking at a half a million dollars already invested in that site. So that's all under consideration. Not something we relished on. Um, but when they say that there's parts of that capture system, if you shoot into it, it can teardrop and actually deflect back toward the shooter. You can imagine the uh, phone call I got saying, you need to go close that immediately. And uh, we need to seek out a solution. So. You know, thank you for addressing that. I, I'm going to bring something up. Uh, you know, I clarified with my fellow commissioners here that uh, it's a state-owned facility. Yes, sir. And I want to challenge our director and staff maybe. we. We both we share that eight cent amendment seventy five, so maybe there's something that we can do together. Okay, that we can sit down, go over all that, and we find a way, Tabby, that we can work with our partner that shares this amendment seventy five, and we can come up with a two hundred or whatever, and get that thing right. But it's going to need to be managed right. I mean, you can't take machine guns and all this other mess out there and destroy it. But I think there might, there's a will, right, guys? So there, there's a way. Let us sit down, and I would task our director. Do you know, Ford, we actually have, uh, I see Chris Kochleiser nodding his head. We actually have a little bit of ownership here in the fact that we, we help manage that and getting it open now to where 
that 12,000 acres is now open for hunting, correct? A good part. Yeah. You, you hear the point. Let, let and, us take and the And Game and Fish paid for part of it from the front end, too. Okay, yeah. He, li, listen, this is why we're having these town hall meetings right here, okay? You're adamant about it. We've heard a lot of complimentary things. This is exactly why we have these things. The director has that action step. We'll follow up, and we'll go from there. Is he making uh, big commitments two months before he's leaving? <laughs> I don't no, know. No, no, I'm trying. I, Bobby lives up here, and I'm going to give y'all his cell number. <laughs> Get her done. Uh, there was a, a second part of that question about about whitetail deer. Ralph Meeker, our deer program coordinator. I mean, did you want to chime in on that? Hold up, Ralph. Let's get this on the record. Yeah, so managing urban deer is, is a pretty tricky subject there, and, and uh, we do have a program, our urban deer hunt program, where we have several cities around the state that, that implement urban deer hunts uh, because we do recognize, because of urban sprawl, I mean, we do have, you know, a lot of deer human conflicts, and those urban deer hunts really allow us to get into cities and archery hunt only. Uh, but we do have to have the buy-in in those cities or municipalities uh, because we, a lot of times we're working against city ordinances which restrict the use of any kind of firearm or archer equipment. So uh, we want to make sure we have the buy-in of the city to, to help us out to get that going. But, but I'll be happy to speak with you afterwards on, or on these urban deer hunts. I I'm, I'm going to suggest, Mr. Seagraves, that you and Ralph get together afterwards. We've got a few more folks to get in here. I don't mean to cut you off, but I think that y'all could probably uh, make a little bit more hay outside on, 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 on that one, get a little bit deeper on that. Next is uh, Walt Brock. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm from Lowell, and uh, my question's already been answered about... Uh, Shooting range. Thank you. All right. Uh, next is Dwayne Wright. Good afternoon. Thank you, guys. Uh, deal with a lot of y'all throughout the year. Everybody I deal with is always upbeat, happy, do their job well. However, I'm unhappy with several things. Pigs is one of them. We're fill killing 5,000 average a year, 200,000 population. You got to kill 70% of the pig population to keep it even. That's a failed program in my opinion. Uh, our hunter numbers. I feel like they'll continue to decline with CWD. We're eliminating trophy hunting by killing too many bucks removing antler restrictions, uh, the meat hunters. As soon as he gets a call, you got a CWD positive deer, they're done hunting. And the uh, recreational hunters, when you got to travel to hunt, you got to debone it before you go home, which that's the only way to operate in CWD zone, but they're done. They, they're cutting off part of their hunting time and heading home because you're not going to go deboning deer on Saturday afternoon when you got to head home that evening. Uh, turkey. I would love to know what the answer to that is. I'm sure all everybody would. Uh, he said we're going to give classes on our habitat. I've been to some of the best habitat in the country, I feel like. Gene Rush, Bearcat Holla. These guys right down here, they manage it very well. And uh, I think there were three birds killed on Gene Rush this year. Am I right? I looked at it before coming off er, um, in here today. And I think six or seven on Bearcat Hollow. That is very poor. So it's not a habitat issue completely. Uh, I could go on all night, but Ron White says you uh, have ability or a right to remain silent. You just don't have ability. That'd be me. So I'll just shut up and move on. 
This is Jeremy Wood, our, our turkey program coordinator. How's it going? Um, so I've only been here for eight months, but just to give you a quick idea on the gene rush and the bear cat harvest this year, we're having some issues with some of the, the data getting brought over from one of our check-in systems. We run off of two different vendors for that, and the age data that people enter, those reports aren't showing all of the checked harvest. If you look at the totals at the bottom there, they're showing about 4,000 some odd birds right now. Um, our actual harvest is in around 7,800 birds. So everything we have at the zone level right now is low because we're missing about 3,000 birds. Um, so until we get that, I won't be able to know exactly how many birds have been checked on any specific zone. Right, right. And I mean, there's decline in populations in turkeys throughout the southeast. I can't. <laughs> yep. Right, no, definitely. I mean, on public lands, what was that? There's lots of problems, honestly. There's no one particular answer with turkey populations in the state. Nope, we can't, honestly. I mean, we have weather, like we've heard for other different species with waterfowl. That's something we can't control. Habitat is a big one we can control. But as an agency, we're able to influence that on public land, which is about 10% of the state. There's a lot more of that that needs to get done on private lands. We're working, we have a great private lands program trying to get program programs in, implemented hey, on private lands. Dwayne, you had a lot of questions. Well, let, let's let's pick up outside, and, and we're going to have tables set up. That's just information for everybody. If you want to get a little deeper on something else, I don't I don't mean to cut you off, but there's four or five more people, and and I, I can tell you you want to talk about this, and and, and we want to talk to you, uh, John Conklin. Thank you for being here. Um, I guide, and I've really uh, gotten into the walleye guiding, which uh, is kind of a niche, not a whole lot of people doing it. My question is, and it was answered before, you're putting 100,000 walleye in the lake a year, I guess. I've been to a lot of states where I've walleye fished, and usually they have a slot limit of like 15 to 18 inches to protect the spawners. The adult fish, what I believe, what I've heard, and I guess the biologist will tell me, is that when they're over 18 inches, that's the fish that are actually the viable spawners, they're mature. Uh, have you thought about, well, first of all, is our walleye fishery a put and take like trout, or is this something that we're gonna manage that we have recruitment naturally from the walleye? Um, and have you thought about a slot limit or maybe one over X inches? Because uh, there's a lot of, uh, people that are really wanting to do this, and I think it's another way to really make Beaver Lake shine, too. And some of the wall, uh, striper guides can maybe pick up on uh, guiding for walleye. That's my question. Is it a put and take, or are we actually getting recruitment from the, uh, the fish themselves? Okay, can you, uh, can you repeat your first part of the question? The first part is, um, in most states with really good walleye populations, the way the Department of Fish and Game or whatever, you know, whatever entity they're, they're called, usually has a, uh, like a one over X amount of inches uh, to keep. Um, what I see a lot of uh, in my fishing, and I fish about every day, is a lot of people keeping four fish, and yeah, they're all 21, 23 inches, which is great, but those are full of eggs. They're sitting there, you know, holding them up, and if we, if it's a put and take, like rainbow trout, well, I get it. You know, if we're putting in X amount of walleye a year and we don't plan on any recruitment, then I understand the 18 inches. My question is, is do we manage this for, are, are we getting recruitment from walleye? Do we know that? And uh, would you ever consider like a 15 to 18 inch keep them three and one over 21 or something like that? Okay. 
as I mentioned earlier, we were doing a stock contribution study, and that's we're going to be able to evaluate what natural reproduction is. We tried doing it for one year. We're going to do a three-year study, but in 2011, we had some marked fish out in the population. Um, we weren't able to get a good sample, but some other lakes similar to Beaver Lake, um, I think it was on uh, Table Rock Lake in Bull Shoals, they showed that there was pretty good uh, natural reproduction on high water years. That's what we're going to find out with this stock contribution study we have going on right now. What is, what's natural reproduction look like? Do we have high stock contribution or low stock contribution? So until we, you know, answer that, we're not going to be able to I believe there's pretty significant natural reproduction because it seems like when we have good flows of water coming into the lake during before the spawn and during the spawn, and then the lake stays high all year, we have good natural, it seems like good natural reproduction. We have huge year classes from those high water events. So one thing to change in the regulation or looking at different regulations, we are putting together a Beaver Lake Fisheries Management Plan, and it's going to be a plan that guides the fishery for the next five years. And we're going to have public input on that plan, so we'll be able to talk through some of these things. The lake right now we, is not a put-and-take fishery. It's a put, grow, and take fishery, and it's, it's expanding over the years. We uh, annually sample the lake every year with, with gill nets, and we continually see bigger and bigger fish. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a young population. So hopefully that answers your first question. What was your second one? So, like, if I'm out guiding, you know, I've seen on some North Dakota uh, YouTube shows where they have a tag in the fish. So I'm out there 200 days, 250 days a year. Are you going to, is it going to be able to where we, the guides that are out there can participate in that? The, the stock contribution study, we're actually marking these fish with oxytetracycline. And it's, it's only, you can only look at that under a microscope at the lab. That's how we're going to determine the stock contribution. But as I said, any of the questions you any other questions that you have about the walleye population, make sure you look look up and find out about this management plan process because we're going to have public comment where we can kind of hash some of these things out. Right, it's uh, it, it's it's fairly new, and yeah, it's uh, we're pretty excited about the walleye population. You see, uh, people are pretty happy about it. Richard Keene. Richard. Hello, I'm Richard Keene. I'm from Springdale, Arkansas, and. Uh, Apologize, I came in late, so I didn't hear a lot of the questions that were asked. And I had a, a four-part question, I think two parts were touched on about the turkey. Uh, what I want to ask, uh, the, the other two parts, uh, I hunt public land. Um, I hunt uh, Piney Creek Wildlife Management Area a lot. And I'd like to ask uh, about the relation, I'd like to get a little more information about the relationship between the Arkansas Game and Fish and the Forestry Service concerning control burns, um, the timing of the control burns. Uh, I also want to ask about food plot management. I've noticed over the years that uh, a lot of the food plots have been left unmaintained and grown up. And I want to ask about the future of that and basically the overall future of the uh, Arkansas Game and Fish plan on the management of the turkey population, because we all know that it's declining. And I don't know what the numbers were in uh, Piney Creek, but I know they were very low. Uh, and that is low, very low. So that's... That's all, all right. I question about the uh, cooperation between the Forest Service and Game and Fish uh, as it relates to prescribed fires and food plots, I think is the first part of that question. Before Jeremy talks, <clears throat> I just want to say one thing about burning. Overall, burning is just it's a, one of the best things we can do. It's one of the best tools we have. 
We are very limited sometimes in, in the windows that we have to burn in, the, in our forestry communities. Uh, we have to let things get dormant, and it has to be done before things get too greened out. And unfortunately, that's when we get a lot of our, our winter rains. And so the number of days we can burn or in scope are very limited. The Forest Service, two and a half, two point seven million acres, and the amount of acres they burn is is a small percentage. Um, so even if they do burn during turkey season, up here in April, in the scheme of things, they're not hurting. Um, Every burn we do is a good thing. It doesn't matter if it's late or it's early. It's doing it long term. It's doing our, our habitat uh, good for our turkey and our, and our deer and our quail. So <clears throat> Jeremy can address the relationship we have on Piney Creek. I'm not sure about um, how that works with the Forest Service in, uh, in our food plot management on Piney. All right, so obviously Piney Creeks is a cooperatively managed WMA. We manage basically the hunting seasons and things like that. Forest Service controls most of the actual on the ground management in those areas. Um, food plots, from my understanding, and I've been here for about eight months, um, those are cooperatively managed. And from my understanding, about half of those food plots are getting planted on a given year, and the other half are remaining fallow. Um, and then they rotate from year to year. So, and if you go out and you look at a lot of these food plots that may be planted and they look like, you know, they're not doing much, you know, you're only looking at about an inch or two of a growth out there, those plots are actually getting pretty well hammered by the wildlife that are out there. Saplings, and, and I'm not particularly familiar with Piney Creeks. Um, those may be old logging decks or potentially food plots that they've, they've let go so that they can focus on other ones. Right, right. And like I say, I've been here for eight months. I can't speak specifically to all of this. Um, Brad, would you like to? I'm going to hand the mic off to Brad. Brad Corner, our chief of wildlife. Uh, yeah, I, I was actually. Uh, it, it may be that mic here, Brad. Give it a shot. Um, um, for uh, a few years, I was the regional supervisor in Russellville and, and uh, coordinated directly with the Forest Service uh, for Piney Creek WMA. Actually, at Piney Creek, we were on a three-year rotation uh, with our wildlife openings there, but we did undergo a process. Uh, most of those averaged just over an acre in size. There were over 300 wildlife openings across Piney Creek, uh, and so it just logistically, we had to have about a three-year rotation. We did go through an assessment process that we, we dropped uh, some of those that were difficult to access, small. Logistically, it didn't, it didn't make sense to continue to manage those as openings. So without specifically knowing exactly which opening, there, there are some that were dropped from the system. But the long-term plan is to continue to manage uh, a, a number of food plots there uh, on on a rotation, but there there were some that have been dropped from the the rotation in the past few years, just logistically difficult to access, small in size, uh, and and all of that is done through contractors. So uh, it with so it just made sense as we went through the assessment process. So that that may be some of what you're seeing, maybe one or more of those that were dropped from the rotation. Hey Brad, I'd like for you or Jeremy to address this. What is the, what are our goals with the turkey program? What does the future look like? Right, so quickly, uh, we, we realize lots of concerns about turkeys. We're on a, a declining trend. Many other, south, most other southeastern states are also on a de declining trend. Uh, Jeremy and our turkey team are working through a, a revision of our strategic plan. Uh, and, and hope to have that in the coming uh, months over the summer and into the fall. But really, uh, if you think about our, our historic high harvest in about 2003 was just under 20,000 turkeys. That also included a high percentage of jakes. So if you, we now have a no jake restriction uh, in order to try to increase carryover of birds. So if you remove jakes from that, 
you you get down to a, a, a record harvest of about 15,000 adult gobblers. And so our long-term plan realistically is try to manage for and maintain a statewide harvest of somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 to 15,000 adult gobblers. Uh, and so we, we realize there's lots of confounding factors, issues. We're gonna work to try to address what we can, uh, those that we can. But it, it's important that we have realistic expectations. Uh, you know, all states, once they introduced, reintroduced turkeys, had stocking efforts, turkey numbers expanded, and you, you had a high that was probably above what your long-term sustainable population is. And so it's unrealistic to think that we'll ever have a statewide harvest of, of, of 20,000 turkeys long term. We, we, it, our expectations should be somewhere slightly below that, but somewhere in the twelve to 15,000 range of adult gobblers is what, what we think is a reasonable expectation. But we're, we'll be working lots of more public outreach workshops, uh, public comment as we, we move forward with drafts of that strategic plan, but be looking for more and more opportunities to input and to plug in uh, with turkeys in, in the coming months. Hey, again, I would encourage y'all to get with Jeremy and, and, and perhaps Brad uh, when we wrap up here and, and we can get a little bit deeper in some of that. We got a couple more. I'm sorry, Commissioner Martin. I know we don't want to stretch this out, but I, I, I think you would have picked up on it about three times. Jeremy said, I've been here about eight months. Uh, you know, this commission is limited on a budget, but there's an area where that priority has been placed and having a full time turkey biologist in that team now. Uh, we hope. In fact, we wish we'd had them probably before. Could have done that, but I wouldn't want to miss that. And uh, Jeremy, your boat's loaded. <laughs> the pressure's on, Jeremy. Uh, next up is Paul Blackburn. Said my name's Paul Blackburn. I bow hunt, turkey hunt, spoonbill fish. And uh, like that remark, I don't think you guys have, I like you guys, don't get me wrong, I don't think you guys have really been good stewards for the bow hunters up here and the fishermen up here. It's, it, it's, several, it's several things that affect us and been affect us. Uh, like you're talking about, she's talking about putting that gun range back over there in Weddington. Okay, the problem with that was a lot of shooting, but the underlying problem was the four-wheelers. We come to this meeting several years ago to get the four-wheelers and the gun shooting stopped, okay? I said, okay, no, no four-wheelers and, and no shooting. Now you're gonna put it back over there. And, you know, I feel like y'all don't take any considerations for bow hunters. That's a bow hunting only area. And then you put a gun range right in the middle of it and guys start abusing it again. And like, every guys in here, they holler out, well, y'all need more, more money. Well, way back in the 70s and 80s, I think, I can't remember what's the date, but y'all asked for a one eighth of 1% tax increase. And with that, y'all got Thirty, at least thirty-two million dollars above mm -hmm. license mm -hmm. when hunting was good back then. Now, over at uh, Madison County, years and years ago, before before y'all uh, cut out the uh, turkey hunting over there, it wasn't no turkeys. And thirty-two million dollars a year, y'all didn't spend one dime to buy a turkey to put back over there. And you can walk all over these hills in northwest Arkansas, turkey hunting. You'd be lucky to find a turkey. And if you're going to kill 20,000 turkeys all over the state, something is wrong with that. And like the uh, spoonbill fishing, you got to be a mile from a dam before you can, can catch a, a fish. You're allowed two fish. What difference does it make if you catch two fish, if you allow two fish, you catch them anywhere up and down the river. And, and that's, that's kind of a thing there. I'm trying to think of a, also like this, uh, as he pointed out, this man talked about uh, the deer population, it's overcrowding. 
And, and wedding, like I said, is a bow hunting only area out there. But it's not that many deer. It's more deer in the town around Fayetteville, Arkansas, anywhere you want to go than you'll probably find in Weddington, uh, National Forest out there. And also, we, we bow hunters. Y'all don't consider us at all. And our equipment, our tools we use. And then we go out to a bow hunting only area, whether it's in Madison County, um, over on Weddington. And we get there and we locked out. We locked out of a place that y'all spent money for for us to hunt in. But you post us out. You got gates across them. And you said, well, well that's, that's the uh, National Forest people that's locking you out. But you're supposed to be uh, helping us out, not just the National Forest. We're not outlaws and crooks. We can use those roads. What are, are y'all going to do about that? Are y'all going to just keep locking us out? Mr. Blackburn, let's, uh, anybody want to respond to that? Or is this, you, you covered a lot of ground there, so perhaps. Hey, I, th uh, I appreciate your comments. We're going to take note of every one of them, and we'll address them. Well, please don't lock us out. Let us use these roads to turkey hunt. You can't walk a, a hundred miles carrying a. Are you, you talking about locking out? They're putting uh, barriers gate, over uh, the road, gates, berms, and all that. Okay. Keep us from I, using I, these I'm good not, roads. I'm not as familiar with Weddington, maybe as Bobby or somebody. Yet. We're going to study every comment you made. It's all over, all over National Forest, Madison County, Weddington, Hobbs. Okay. Bermed up, locked out. Why, why should we be locked out? That's the place for us to enjoy. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Blackburn. We'll, Thank we'll you. follow up with you. Uh, Tanner Cloud. In the back. Hi, I am from um, Western Benton County, and I just had a question about um, the turkey thing. I don't mean to hound it, but um, is there anything that we as landowners and farmers can do to partner with you all? to help try to bring back some birds. Um, you know, I know that predator control, um, habitat um, improvements and things like that can be made, but if there's no birds to take advantage of those things, how can we expect them to come here? You know, what can we do to help bring birds in? We are fortunate. We have, I think it's 10 private lands biologists. Uh, there will be a PLB, a private lands biologist up here that could get with you and go to your place, help work out a management plan um, that would include possibly stocking if, if there are no turkey within a certain radius. But I think for the most part, our state is in good shape numbers wise to populate the, the state. Um, but specific plans for your site um, one of our PLBs will get with you and uh, would would love to assist you with a with a management plan Ted will you raise your hand uh, Ted Zavishlock is the is the coordinator of our private lands biology program how about y'all get together a after the uh, discussion here and he can probably get you connected with the specific staff member who can help you out Okay, that's uh, that's that's a wrap for questions. That's everybody that signed up to ask questions, and we're we're pretty much on time. I'll kick it back over to Chairman Ford Overton yep. to uh, wrap things up. Okay, great. Uh, do we have any other questions? Yes, sir. Wait, Hi, you, my name. Um, you dropped all your. I get it later. You're good. My name is Rustin Johnson. I'm a student at the University of Arkansas. I'm graduating in May and then starting law school uh, in the fall at the university. Uh, my question is, are the dates for deer season just kind of arbitrary or are they there for like a reason? Because I know that harvest totals, uh, I keep up with it on a daily basis because I'm, I'm very much into deer hunting. And uh, the harvest totals, especially like in February, I don't know why the season is open until February 28th when it could probably be shifted uh, a month back. Uh, I know that there's only like one or two deer killed in February. Uh, and to maybe get more money and attract out-of-state people, 
maybe some velvet buck opportunities, maybe shifting it to September 1st opening and then closing maybe the last day of January would be spectacular. Uh, and then also I want to reiterate the hog situation. Uh, you said that you weren't going to trap our way out of the situation. So I don't know why we're allocating all kinds of funds to trapping if that's not the solution and we've spent some time kind of trapping and seeing the results from it. Uh, if we could take maybe like a five year dedicated time period to maybe allow some of these people uh, bow hunting public lands to maybe see if, because I have hogs underneath my tree stand all the time and I want to shoot them so bad, but I can't. And uh, if we just dedicate maybe a time period to study the effects of bow hunters taking action against hogs. Uh, I know that you say that they spread and stuff, but they're gonna keep spreading all around and maybe if we keep shooting them in different areas, they're just gonna keep crisscrossing and it'll be hectic for them and maybe, Got I'm it. not a hog expert Got it. though. But yeah. well, I, your comments are wonderful and, and, and your questions are wonderful. And what I'm gonna ask you to do is get with uh, Brad Corner, our chief of wildlife, right there after this meeting and visit with him, and he can explain some of, some of these uh, things that you might. Uh, but 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 the passion out here is awesome, and the comments are awesome, and that's why we have these things. And so thank you, but instead of taking the time right now to drill down on all the items, thank you for taking the time. Congratulations on being in law school. and and uh, stay passionate about the outdoors. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Okay, hold, hold on one second, please. Wait for the microphone. Oh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, a two-part question. Kind of, I've, I've not heard a word about the quail restoration efforts. Uh, what's the commission's goal in that? What's your outlook? And also the uh, CWD situation is, is the long-term uh, outlook, positive, negative. In other words, where are we going to be 10 years from now? What's happened in these other states have been dealing with this for a long time. Right. I, I'm, I'm going to hit both those real quick. So 90% of the state of Arkansas is privately held. Okay? 90%. 89% to 90%. Okay. We have 16 private lands biologists. Okay. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Ted Z, where are you? You need to see, see Ted Z right over here. We, we have 16 private lands biologists, okay, dedicated to the 90% of Arkansas, like you were mentioning earlier, to address that. We have one dedicated to this specific area. Yes, to this region. Ted will help you out, okay, so I want to address that. Second thing I want to address is CWDs here. Ted, will you stand up? No, really, no, really, stand up. There, there. Okay, that's fine, that's fine. But y'all come, y'all visit with them because these are their private lands guys that that are awesome, a great resource. Hugh is actually their guy that just stood up and raised his hand. That's the one you want to talk to. Don't worry about yeah. Ted. Talk yeah, go, Hugh. go straight to Hugh there. Hugh, get ready, brother. Hugh, but, how many how, Hugh, how many programs already do you have going right now? How many projects? Yeah, with private landowners. Uh, well, last year about seventeen or eighteen. Oh. Uh, last year in this in this region up here, this uh, you know Washington, Benton, Carroll, Madison, Newton, Boone, had about eighteen projects going last year, and got up here in about June, and now I've got about eight and a couple more in the works, so. We're, you know, we're, we're trying to do as many projects as we can, and we can do, you know, so many each year, and we kind of get to people or get to projects as we can, you know, get to them. So you, you get, get, get with, get with yeah. who's interested, because I'm going to tell you, this is a wonderful resource that's free to the citizens of the state to come in and evaluate your property and help you put together a plan for what you want to accomplish. Second question. CWD, CWD's here. CWD's gonna be here. We have taken an active role, and I'm real proud of what this Arkansas Game Fish Commission has done by, led by the staff, to contain it as best that we can, okay? 
Chronic wasting disease is here. We're not going to get rid of it. We're, it is in the hottest zone, the most prevalent zone, is it right in the county that he lives in. I think he might have brought it in. <laughs> Newton County. That is, uh, that is the hottest, that is the most prevalent in the state of Arkansas. It is here. We're not going to get rid of it. Best we can do is maintain it. Well, I'm concerned about a lot of things related to CWD, but what I'm trying to say is answer his question. We have it. The best that we can do is maintain it. Furthermore, is that we offer the service to the citizens of the state to sample the deer and get the results back to you before you consume the deer. We can get with you on all that. Je uh, Jeff, why don't you get with him and make sure that we, we, we'll answer all those specifics about where in Washington County. Yeah, we, you know, we've got some. We got all that. We've got some maps available here. I'm, I'm looking at a couple of folks from our research evaluation and compliance division. Corey and Jen, would y'all mind just standing up? Just so when we wrap up, we've got some material. Uh, you, we, you can find out where you can have deer tested here in Washington County or in Benton County and, and many other counties up here we, in the CWD management you know, we zone. Wanna, we want to offer that service. We do offer that service, and, it, and it's a service to the state. So anyway, any – all right, go ahead. Being an old quail hunter, I want to put in a plug for Quail Forever, the 16 private lands biologists we have that cover the entire state. I think it's nine of those that Quail Forever helped pay, pay for. Is that, mm -hmm. is that correct? Seven. So that there's a, if you uh, if you belong to Quail Forever, some of your money's coming back to Arkansas to help us. Um, hey, Chairman. I, you know, again, we're stretching it out, but you know, if you don't feel like you're getting the information, uh, one thing I could continue to encourage you. There's a lot of transparency. So what's going on, like with CWD? The results of our sampling uh, by county and so forth, that's out there on our website uh, to be able to track and follow the progress. I mean, we want it to be very transparent what's happening, what we see by county. I see uh, Dr. Ballard down here shaking her head. And, you know, our, our commitment, I think, is to make sure the, the deer hunter of Arkansas knows what's happening all the way. And what's going what's gonna to be like in 10 years? What was your question a while ago? I don't know that we know. But we're certainly, again, we think we're doing the right things from a management standpoint right now and there is a table was there one other this room, uh, the, the gentleman material. in the blue shirt here i think that's our last question thank you y'all touched on the biggest uh construction project for this region that the game and fish is doing was there any consideration for the number of people in for the shooting ranges at that time y'all decided to make this the largest project couldn't you have scaled it down helped out Hobbs with their problems, or was that even a consideration at that time? That, that, that's a good question. We are long overdue making a presence and having a nature center up here in this area. Nature center is where it is, you can go ed, educate. Well, Tabby, I'm gonna tell you, can you give a, just a broad brush of what we're getting ready to put in up here? And I want you to listen, because it's gonna touch every kid, every child up here. I, I, all right. Nature and Education Center. Yeah, so um, a nature center in general is a place that um, students and families can go to connect to all the stuff that we, f we are willing to show up on a Tuesday evening and talk about. Um, so we've talked about the disconnect. People are getting out outdoors less. So this is a place where that is the focus. Um, this nature center project includes an indoor archery range and an outdoor 3D range on the site here um, between Wagon Wheel Road and Elm Springs Road um, right off of 40th Street. So there is a range component to this project. And I, Jeremy's been here eight months. I've been here for 10 months. So I wasn't involved in the uh, conversations around um, the size or the scope of the project, but I will say that um, one of the things I'm nervous about is this facility and the population up here. This population may 
um, be bigger than we can accommodate for the need that we see. I don't know if that made sense. What was that? It'll be free because of that one eight cent sales tax. The other thing to really know about this project is that the funding for this project, uh, about 50% of it is from private funding. This isn't, this isn't all sales tax. This isn't all game and fish funding. We are working with private um, entities and other partners. So, um, um, any, anything Thanks, else? Tammy, that, that was perfect. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask our director if you would like to make any comments before we wrap up. My name is Pat Fitz. I'm director of the Game and Fish, and I think one giant takeaway tonight is conservation in Arkansas is important. If it wasn't, you wouldn't be here tonight, and neither would we. I think we're all passionate about the things that we've been blessed with here in this state, and although we may not always line up on stuff, our hope and our desire is to make all of our game populations and to offer as much opportunity to the sportsmen of the state of Arkansas to go partake. We're, we're part of you. We love it. We bow hunt. We fish. We love to use the resource too. So I would say this. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for engaging with our staff. And thank you to the commissioners for bringing this meeting on the road. This is not an easy thing to do. Uh, when you pack up with this many staff and you, you roll out this far from home, it's not easy, but it's important. So I appreciate the commissioners making this a high priority. It's great to get out here and engage with you. The conversations that are fixing to take place after this meeting's over are going to be very important as our staff engages with you. So there will be some good quality exchange there. So that's all I have. Thank you for for allowing us to, to interact with you tonight here. I was gonna say, uh, let's take this opportunity, for, if, if you're a, a staff member that's gonna man one of the, uh, the tables out here, it might be a good opportunity to, to sort of get out there. Uh, I know when we did this exercise for the first time back in February, it sort of turned into a, a scrum here in the auditorium. So uh, let's let those folks uh, make their way out and then just wanted to throw that in. Thank you, yeah, Ford. I, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you did that. I'll never forget, we, uh, the meeting in February, I'll never forget this guy's name, Jeremy Miller. Y'all remember Jeremy Miller? Jeremy Miller brought up a point, and it was the first question in a town hall meeting that we, the, the first town hall meeting. And Jeremy Miller asked, why don't we have, um, what was the specific, what, what, a set distance that, would be considered hunting a turkey over bait. In other words, 30 yards or, you know, do you have to be 50 yards from a, a deal and, and uh, from the bait or whatever bait pile you're hunting over? Well, uh, one of our majors, uh, um, Brad Young, stood up and addressed, but he, here's, here's my whole point. We didn't have a specific answer. Okay, we had an answer. We're imperfect. We need help. We don't have all the answers to everything. But Jeremy Miller started this whole thing, and I'll never forget. That's why we're standing here tonight. We're all outdoorsmen. We're all passionate. We're all focused. We're all committed. We are all, we put so much of our blood, sweat, and tears behind the conservation of this wonderful state. But it's you that we serve. You gotta know who you're serving. You gotta talk to who you're serving. We gotta ask those questions, and we gotta be able to answer those questions. We're not gonna be perfect. We don't intend to be perfect. I mean, we try to be perfect, but we're never gonna be perfect. But that's why we're here tonight is to open up this dialogue like we've had, and we appreciate y'all being here and uh, providing the feedback. I had no idea 
that there was that level of a demand for a shooting range in northwest Arkansas. I mean, I, this is staggering to me, okay? That's another reason that we're all, J.D. and I are by, over here going, golly, dude, man, this is crazy. So there, that's one takeaway. But anyway, I appreciate every being here, uh, everyone being here tonight and taking the time to do this. It's important to the Arkansas Game Fish Commission and the staff. Thank you and good night.